Thank you, choir. Thank you, readers of the scriptures. Thank you for those who are singing and those who are leading us tonight. And they've all already brought us into the drama of the cross and the beauty and the wonder and the awe of what took place 2,000 years ago. I think it'd take a, a thousand preachers to even try and preach what we have tonight in Isaiah 53 as we're going to go through this passage together. As we're looking at the first half, Pastor Chris and I will be sharing uh, Isaiah 53, uh, one part focusing on the suffering of God's Holy One, and then on Sunday, the exaltation, the coronation of God's Holy One. When we think of Jesus coming to the waters of the Jordan River, and John the Baptist was waiting for him, and Jesus was about to enter the waters, and John the Baptist pointed straight to him in front of the people of Israel and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I would say nobody but John really understood what he just said. The people who were hearing this understood Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world, but they could not understand how. How would the Lamb of God actually take away the sins of the world? You see, John the Baptist was a prophet. Jesus said he was the greatest of all the prophets. That's quite a compliment. And it means that John was ahead of events before they happened. Not only ahead of them, but he was also deep in the understanding and the meaning of those events. And behind what he is saying, behind his words, is the chapter we're looking at tonight. It's Isaiah 53. We heard the first three servant songs, and they kind of build up. And in some of those songs, you could hear, going back and forth, Israel, Messiah, Israel, Messiah. Israel was called the servant of God, and so was the Messiah. And the four songs together give us something of a profile of the Messiah, a mini picture of this one that was to come, this servant of God. You may not know, but Isaiah is one of the most historically attested books of the Bible. It's a book that was greatly attacked, severely attacked by higher critics, and they said it's just too precise in its prophecies to actually be what it claims to be, the Word of God. There, there must be three Isaiahs. It's just too uncanny that they could prophesy so precisely into the future. But they were wrong. The critics were wrong because we know in 1947 there was a great discovery. It was the beginning of the Qumran cave discoveries, and one of the discoveries as a Bedouin shepherd dropped a, a stone in a, a cave and heard this crashing of an urn, inside one of those urns was the entire scroll of the book of Isaiah. Those who are going to Israel in just uh, two weeks will be brought to a place called the Shrine of the Book, where the entire scroll of Isaiah is on the wall and goes right around all 66 chapters. An amazing discovery. And that particular discovery brought the, uh, the text that we have of Isaiah to within 150 years of Jesus' birth, still before he came. And so what we have in Isaiah are the words Jesus read are the ones we read tonight. It's the same book. It's that beautiful transmission of God's word. What we have in the book of Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible. It's an incredible book. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible divides in two, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. The book of Isaiah divides exactly like that. The first part, 39 chapters. The second part, 27 chapters that divide by three, nine, nine, nine. All about salvation. It's an amazing, amazing book. Many of the essential, the most essential doctrines of the New Testament are found in the chapter we're looking at tonight. That's why it takes a thousand preachers to go through this. It's just, there's too much there. So we'll try and take what we can for tonight. And it is so beautiful, it's been called the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. The 53rd of Isaiah is the fourth song, the fourth servant song. And it's a mix of lament. You could probably feel some of that lament as the chapters were being read to you tonight. Uh, you probably got a sense of the prophetic. There, there are prophecies in there, and they point straight to the one we were singing about tonight. 
What you might not know is this fourth servant song was also, and I came to understand this in the last two weeks as I studied, uh, and a lot of John MacArthur and a lot of his help, that this is the national confession, national song of repentance of Israel at the end of history. When the second coming happens, Israel will look back at this time and see what happened in their relationship with their own Messiah and how they missed it. And so they will confess, and a lot of their confession is in this song. Isaiah looks forward to the birth of Christ. He looks forward to the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the second coming of Christ, and the millennium. This is a major prophet, major prophecies. And he is the one that gives us the deepest meaning of the most significant death that has ever been experienced in human history. He explains it to us. So now turn with me, if you have your Bibles, in whatever form you have, paper or electronic, to this most amazing, astonishing chapter, I think, in the Old Testament, the 53rd of Isaiah. It is one song, five stanzas, three verses each, but it actually begins in chapter 52, so whoever set the chapters, <laughs> it's really back in 52. That's where the song begins. And so to give you sort of the big forest view picture, stanza one and stanza five, God is speaking. It is the I of the Lord. I, God is saying, and my servant. Stanza two, three, and four, it is we. It is the confession of Israel, and we join in with them in that confession. Before Jesus came, and apart from Jesus, this chapter was baffling. Before Jesus came, this chapter would be read. <laughs> I imagine the temple or in synagogues, and people wondered and scratched their heads, what does this mean? What can this mean? And those who reject Jesus, this is the forbidden chapter. This is the chapter that is not to be read. From John MacArthur's little book, Pastor Chris and I are reading, 200 pages on one chapter. He really went into the depths of the meaning of this chapter. I'm taking his outline, so I'm going to give him credit for the outline, and hopefully the rest is mine and the Lord helping me. But his amazing outline goes like this. The five stanzas, stanza one, chapter 52, verses 13 to 15, the appalling servant. Chapter 53, verses one to three, the rejected servant. Verses four to six, the substitute servant. Verses seven to nine, the silent servant. And on Sunday, the exalted servant. Verses 10 to 12. Our first stanza brings together these extreme opposite experiences of the servant. The stanza one and stanza five are really beginning and ending in the same place, his supreme, glorious exaltation, but in the middle, his appalling suffering. Those are extreme, different kinds of experiences. Verse 13, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond any of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. And the best reading, many nations will be astonished and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. You notice the shift. We begin in the future. You know, he will be exalted. And we go right away back to the past, his suffering. And then it's back to the future again, all in three verses. And those who stumble over this, as Jesus said they would, they will stumble over the chosen stone, stumble over his suffering. They embrace the exaltation. We, we love the exaltation of the servant, but then stumble over his suffering. John MacArthur said that his exaltation, and I love this word, he says it escalates. And what he means by this, it goes from high to higher to highest. It's very beautiful. It means Jesus, when it says he is raised from the dead. 
when he is lifted up, it's speaking of his glorious ascension into heaven. And when he is exalted, it is his coronation at the right hand of the Father. We'll look at those uh, next week, next Sunday. Many would disagree with the idea that it is Jesus that's being spoken of here. And disagree with the idea that my servant acted wisely. And many who disagree would say, please, what did he actually accomplish at the cross? If anything, he miscalculated. He overstepped when he entered Jerusalem. Remember last Sunday, riding on that donkey, he, he signed his death certificate. What was he thinking? Why did he do such a thing? But in fact, what he did, according to Isaiah 53, you have to read the chapter, is he fully accomplished God's will without forcing anybody else's will. There's this beautiful play back and forth between the sovereign will of God and the free will of men, and he even allowed men to exercise their very worst against him. Peter brings this out in his teachings. And we go from verse 13, and there's this sudden kind of abrupt shift. It kind of jolts in verse 14, right on paper. There's a, such a shift, but imagine how jolting it was on Easter week, on Passover week, where the crowd greets Jesus with Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and days later, crucify him, crucify him. It's so surprising, so jolting. We go from so exalted to so appalling. And we read the text that said he was marred beyond any human being, disfigured beyond any human being. And then we go to verse 15, and it shifts back to the future again, saying that the nations, it's speaking of the second coming, when they see him, they again will be appalled. They will be astonished. The kings will be silenced. I think it's speaking of collective humanity and all of history. Revelation 1 verse 7 captures all of this. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. People were appalled when it happened. They were appalled at Jesus when they saw him on the cross. And they will be appalled at the second coming because they will realize what happened. The word appalled here is a very strong word. It means to be sick to the stomach. It's a very strong word. And crucifixion was invented to do that, to make people sick to the stomach. This practice had gone on for 500 years and had reached a place of, of almost, you could say, perfection and torture. There were so many instruments used before crucifixion, during, and after. It was designed to instill horror, and it did. For Jesus, there was something, I think, going on more than just a human here. We know that there was a battle going on in the spiritual realm. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light were battling right at the cross. The forces of hell were driving the human actors. The forces of hell started in the Garden of Gethsemane, punching Jesus over and over. The soldiers weave a crown of thorns and press it into his, his brow. They punch him. They spit on him. The intention was to humiliate, to insult, to degrade it was satanic. Jesus was scourged. The flesh was torn. The muscles were lacerated. By the time Jesus stood before Pilate, he was appalling. His face was so swollen. His eyes were swollen shut. The crown of thorns had brought great loss of blood. The scourging even greater. It was a great loss of blood. Jesus was greatly degraded, and disgraced. He was appalling even in the garden when he was crying out to the Father, asking the Father if there's any other way. Father, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And he was sweating blood. The disciples had never seen Jesus like this. It was appalling. It was horrible. The suffering was prolonged on the cross. And he was shamed 
Jesus was probably naked on the cross. People would turn from it. It was so horrible. You could barely look at it. We come to stanza two, and now we come to understand the depth of the rejection, the astonishing rejection of Israel's Messiah. Verse one, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up. Here's the confession again. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. How could the one that was expected for so long, for centuries, by the chosen people be so rejected by them? Isaiah tells us right at the beginning of this stanza, the unbelief was foretold. Who has believed our message? No one believed it. And when we hear the confession here, remember this is at the end of history. They're looking back telling how they saw their own Messiah, what they believed. And what they're saying is he was unimpressive in every way. From beginning to his death, he did not impress us. When it says that he was like a root and dry ground, it really means like a little sucker branch. He's nothing. He's not the branch of David. Who is this little branch from the north, this hillbilly from up north? Who is this refugee baby? Who is his real father? He doesn't look the part. He looks more like a construction worker than a Messiah. Outwardly, he's not impressive. Yes, we've seen the miracles. They were impressive. But we're not sure he's the Messiah. And it's Passover after all. This is Passover week. Remember, this is when Moses said to Pharaoh, Moses to Pharaoh, let my people go. And it happened. And we remember what Jesus said to, well, about Caesar, to the people. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And now we see him standing before all the Roman power, and he looks so defeated. He even looks like he's being punished. But remember, after Satan had done his worst, driving the Sanhedrin, driving the soldiers to kill Jesus, it was Jesus to Satan, let my people go. That's what it was all about. No one could see that. That's what was happening in the spiritual realm that no one could see, this great battle. Jesus was brought so low. The whole thing was a horror show. It was designed to make him look repulsive and look like anything but a Messiah. He didn't even look human. He was marred beyond, beyond any human and disfigured. The fact that he was on a cross and that he dies begs the Jewish question, how could he be the Messiah? You see, the emphasis was on the exaltation and not the suffering. How could he be the Messiah if he dies? And so Isaiah 53 is telling us this is, if you don't read Isaiah 53, you cannot get this. And when we read Isaiah 53, we get it. This is the destiny of the Messiah. He came to die. And when he returns, the nations will be astonished. They will be horrified. They, though they weren't there, it says they will understand and they will see. And so they will say, you mean this wasn't bad karma? No. You mean this was supposed to be in the Quran? Yes. It's not even in the Quran. It's too horrifying to put it in. You mean this should have been read, this Isaiah 53, in every synagogue around the world? Yes. And had it been, had it not been forbidden, well, history would be different. Messiah's astonishing rejection was foretold. 700 years before Jesus came, it was foretold when he comes, he'll be rejected. He will come to his own and his own will not receive him. Isaiah foretold it. And we come now to stanza three, the heart of the song. This is the amazing, it's all amazing, but the, the center of amazingness. <laughs> The center of the song. This is the center of the gospel right here, verses 4 to 6. Again, it's that confession from way back around the second coming, looking back 
to when Jesus was on the cross. Isaiah is telling us what the people will say and what they will see when they look back. This is what they will say. Surely, that's the most important word, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Here's the confession of everyone here tonight. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so the servant steps in as a substitute. He is our substitute. We ask the question, why such suffering? Israel is confessing what they thought at the time. Surely this man is being punished for his horrendous blasphemies. That's why he's on the cross. He's getting what he deserves. That's why he's there. It's for his sins. That's what they thought. He must have offended God in some horrible way. And for 2,000 years, the death of Jesus has been pointed to as evidence for he's not the Messiah. When in fact, Isaiah 53 is telling us, no, this is the destiny of the Messiah. It was so misunderstood. This is what we thought. This is what we thought. And afterwards, they will understand and confess, surely for our pain, our suffering, our transgressions, our iniquities, our peace, our healing, he took our place. Surely he is our substitute. All the prophecies point to him. I've been reading in the book of Exodus, and the Lord's timing is amazing because I didn't plan it this way. And so I'm in my quiet time. I'm in the book of, of Exodus this morning, and the Spirit was telling me, no, don't go to Isaiah, stay right here. Stay here and read and read and go right through all ten plagues. And, and so I did. It took about an hour and a half to go through all the ten plagues. And the Lord was showing me again and reminding me again what the whole point of all the lambs was about. On that first night, that Passover night, which Jewish people are celebrating all around the world in these days. That very first time, Moses said, from now, from this day, Right on, for generations, every family is to sacrifice a lamb. It is to be completely eaten, completely consumed. Whatever's left over, burnt in the fire, but not a bone is to be broken. Strange, why? Well, time would tell. Prophecy would give more information. But it pointed, the millions and millions of lambs pointed the great Old Testament pro problem. And the problem was, how can we keep this up? I mean, how can we have enough lambs to keep providing atonement for a growing nation that grows by the millions? Where will we get all the lambs? And it hasn't been kept up to this day. It is not kept up. And so when Jewish people celebrate the Passover, it's with the memory of a lamb. And it pointed to the problem. The big question in the Old Testament was this. What sacrifice would ever be big enough for all people for all time? All the lambs pointed to one lamb, the lamb who would take away the sins of the world, the one sacrifice for all time. This was not a mis miscalculation. It wasn't a mistake. Jesus' death was not a martyrdom. Your death for him would be a martyrdom in certain circumstances. His death was not a martyrdom. His death was a one-of-a-kind, unique, filled with meaning, and absolutely the only one who was an atonement for our sins. It was all laid on him. The massive load of sin. Jason was saying all of our sins. He was talking about us in this room. But he knows it's even bigger than that. It's all the sins of all the world, of all generations, going back to Adam and Eve. All of that load was laid on Jesus. He bore all of it. All of it. Jesus was in the place of punishment. The chastisement for sin was laid on him. And we might ask the question, you know, why would this happen this way? Why did it have to happen this way? Really, it was either him or us. 
we suffer for our sins eternally or Jesus steps in as a substitute in our place. And we have to realize here that God wasn't pretending. This wasn't a game. Sins had to be paid for. Sins had to be atoned for. Otherwise, it's, it's just a game. Or sinners pay for their own sins. Or sinners walk away scot-free. And that would be a joke. God's justice would be a joke. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, the Greek word here really means paid in full. It's paid. It had to really be paid for. Verse 6 moves us to the problem. When we read verse 6, we realize the problem, it's us. We're the problem. All of us, and we know that. Uh, From the time we were born until the time we're born again, our nature is a nature of corruption. We have a sheep likeness. We tend to stray like sheep. And the more you study sheep, the more you realize what a problem that is. Sheep aren't, uh, they're not the brightest of animals. They just aren't. Uh, The woollier a sheep gets, the bigger a sheep gets. If he rolls over on his back, unless he's got a shepherd to roll him back on his feet, he's going to stay there until he dies. And that sheep needs help. Sheep get lost. Sheep stray. It's just sheepness. We're sheep-like. We do things that are self-destructive. We destroy ourselves. And we are the problem. This is us. And the only solution is Jesus. There is no other solution. There's no medicine. There's no pill. There's no therapy. You can't fix yourself. Only Jesus can take care of this problem. Amen? This brings us to the last stanza. It's beautiful. The servant who is silent in verses 7 to 9. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Here's the servant who was innocent. Even some of his enemies agreed he was innocent. Herod and Pilate, Pilate's wife, one of the thieves on the cross, they said he's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. He shouldn't be here. And yet Jesus stood in the place silently accepting the greatest miscarriage of justice. It was all foretold. Before his accusers, before his mockers, before his executioners, not a word. He was silent. He could have made a very eloquent defense for himself. He didn't fight back. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He embraced it. It was his destiny. It's why he was chosen. One of the servant's songs talked about him being chosen, God's chosen one. He's described like a lamb. Now, his lambness is much different than ours. We are connected to the straying, uh, waywardness of a lamb. But Jesus is compared to a lamb in a different way. As a lamb is led to being sheared or worse, to being slaughtered and says nothing, even will lick the hand of the one that holds the knife because it doesn't know better. Jesus knew. Jesus knew where he was being led to and yet didn't say anything. After the spitting, after the punching, after the pressing of the thorns into his head, after the stripping of his clothes and the scourging and the spikes that went through and through, he said nothing. The indignation was great and the silence was majestic. He commanded the storm to be silent. He commanded the demons to be silent, and now it was him that was silent. He didn't say anything. He didn't fight back. There's a song, remember, we've sung in the past. He could have commanded 10,000 angels, and he didn't. He could have asked them to come and defend him, and I imagine that could have happened, but he'd surrendered his will to the fathers. He'd wrestled over this in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, but your will be done. And it was, it was decided this was going to happen. The leaders, the soldiers, even those who were crucified to the right and the left, t- 
taunted him. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and we'll, we'll believe. Silence. Jesus said nothing. He's silent because he's totally surrendered to the Father's will. Here he is, the Prince of Peace, laying down his life. The Prince of Life is cowed out of the land of the living. He dies. And in the face of such hostility, such indignation, he says nothing. It's majestic. Now, you might be saying in your minds, well, what about some of the things Jesus said on the cross? We're speaking here about silence before his enemies. Jesus prayed for his enemies on the cross, but he didn't fight back. He was surrendered. It is at this point when Jesus dies that the Father intervenes. It's as though the Father is saying, enough indignation. It stops here. We read in verse 9, and this is important to get this point, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any de de deceit in his mouth. And so you know in the Gospel of jo John, after all of this, uh, the two thieves on each side had their legs broken. They took a small sledgehammer and they shattered the femur bone. And imagine what that would be like. And the thief could no longer raise himself on the cross to take another breath and would quickly expire. The bodies would be taken down and the last indignation, the horrible one, they'd be thrown into a common grave. It must have been horrific. Body and corpse upon corpse. That would not happen to Jesus. Isaiah prophesied and the father made sure he raised up Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Sanhedrin members who came to Pilate and pleaded for the body of Jesus, and he took the body of Jesus and placed that beautiful body in the empty tomb, his expensive tomb, everything set up for what would happen early on the Sunday morning. And so we come to this last astonishing truth of, as we put it all together, that the death of God's servant was 100% God's will. We might even say with Isaiah, it was God's pleasure. I need to explain that. We need to understand that. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, and we'll stop the verse there, the rest will be after Sunday morning. But just reading that verse and saying this was God's will it's hard. I wrestled with this for the last two weeks. There's parts of this drama and the meaning of it that are hard to accept. And how do we explain it? That God was present in the wrath that was being experienced on the cross. God was angry with sin. His anger wasn't you know, angry with Jesus. But Jesus was bearing the sin of all the world in his body, and he was in that place of wrath. And it was at that moment that the father was no longer protecting his son. The father had protected his son the entire 33 years of his life. Jesus was hedged with protection all the time, not now. The father had comforted Jesus. The Holy Spirit had comforted Jesus in his human trials. Not now. Jesus was alone on the cross. This is the loneliest place in all of history and all of the world. No wonder Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was the cry of the soul. Even there, Jesus was quoting the scriptures. He was tasting hell for us on the cross. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in total anguish at this time on the cross, in this time of darkness, in anguish together until it was paid, until Jesus said, Tetelestai. How could it please the Father that his Son would suffer so much and so much indignity? It was for us. You see, the result was agreed upon from eternity. He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of creation. This is how the Lamb of God took away the sin of the world. And when Jesus laid down his life, his offering, his sacrifice was pleasing to God. God accepted it because it meant we now could be children of God. We could come into his presence. This is all about love. For God so loved 
the world that he gave his son. And so we add that one more so into all of this and we, we start to get it. This is really all about love. It's about the love of the father to give his son. It's about the love of the son to lay down his life. And it's for us. It's all for us. The billion dollar question, not million, but billion dollar question, you, you might be thinking tonight. So I've never read Isaiah 53 before. I've never seen this. And I don't see the name of Jesus in that chapter. Is this chapter really about Jesus? How can I know that? It's a great question. Once after Jesus and after the apostles were beginning to spread, there was a man from Ethiopia and he had heard preaching at the temple. He, he'd gone down for uh, one of the feasts and he was on his way back to Ethiopia. He was in his chariot. He was a very wealthy man. He had the entire scroll of Isaiah, and he was reading. And guess what chapter he was reading according to Acts 8? This chapter, Isaiah 53. God sent Philip the evangelist to come jogging beside the chariot. And when he heard Isaiah 53, he said, Do you understand what you are reading? How can I unless someone explains it to me? Into the chariot he came, and he asked Philip, does the prophet speak about himself or somebody else? And Philip, it says, from that verse began to preach to him the good news about Jesus. He said Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus. He is the servant of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And all we can do tonight is embrace it. You're here tonight because I believe... <laughs> You know, you love Jesus, and you want to honor him with millions and millions all around the world tonight. But you have to make this very personal. It's for you. And we make it very personal at the table, and that's where we're going now, where it's a personal transaction. I think Jason said the greatest transaction in all of history, all of our sin put on him so that his righteousness can be given to us. That's a personal thing. And so we're coming to the table now. We're asking those who've been asked to serve at the table that you would come forward at this time. And we're going to remember Jesus at the table.